The other one is to buy your collection purposefully. You know, if Justin puts a new snake on Instagram and looks awesome, sure, I'd love for you to buy it, but that may not be the best strategic choice for you. So have a plan and what you want to do. All right, YouTube, it is the maiden voyage of snakes in Starbucks. This is, a, this is our funny take on today's Ask Justin, and we have a special guest with us, Warwick. Hello. South Thank Africa. You. I keep saying he's got an Australian accent, <laughs> but all the, uh, all the ladies here in my little small town think he's, everything he says is awesome. So, makes it fun. This is um, an accent from Joby Zone, aren't you? Yeah, well, it's, yeah, we don't get much of that here no. in rural Georgia. Um, <laughs> uh, but we have work here all the way from South Africa. He is um, filling in for Chase this week. Chase is on vacation, and it's been really awesome having you. Yes, it's been a pleasure being here. So we're going to start with the first question with for you, and then we'll go to the YouTube questions. So how okay. is how is working at JKR, or working in a collection like this different than most people would, would expect? Um, well, I don't think a lot of people realize the time that you put into not just looking after the animals but the small administration things that a lot of people overlook. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I know you've been here some nights until 1am. Oh yeah. Sorting out administration work. Yeah. So I think that's what a lot of people overlook and um, they don't have a systems in place where they can keep track um, completely of what their collection is. Yeah, it's a different concept for a smaller breeder where they have five or six clutches a year. But when you start getting to your 30, 40, 50 clutches a year, you need a system that you can... It doesn't have to be an life. official system like something you purchase, but it has to be something that is that is used religiously okay. by, by your business to... Well, Right, but when, when, when I'm talking about a system, I'm not talking about like an actual software program. I'm talking about a, a manual system where you keep track of the animals right. and then inputting that information. Yeah, processes in, and procedures, right? That's the word. Yes, yeah, absolutely. And we do a lot of that here um, just because it's, it's I, I tell Chase this all the time and, and other employees that I sometimes have too, it'll just be like, these are things that keep, the, keep everything running smoothly. These are the things that keep um, that keep customers safe, that keep us safe, keep the animals safe, is we do things in a certain process, in a certain way. Um, and that, what that does is, if once you have memorized those processes and you follow them religiously, then suddenly your brain is not spending up all its, all its effort keeping track of all the details. Yeah. This process does that. Um, suddenly your brain is freed up to think about clutches and pairings and ideas and how to take care of customers and and all those things I think it's really easy for a business of this size to kind of get into the weeds a little bit yeah. and suddenly they're not able to um, suddenly with where all the creativity go where, where is the the passion for the animals um, and so for JKR part of it's keeping that 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 block of your brain clear for, yeah. the the for that for that side of it because you can't lose that side of it or you're, or you're you know it's we're done yeah so there's no point yeah. um, or else you're just going to be repeating the same thing year in year out which will then get you to fall further behind sure the up and sure people. there's yeah there's lots of way, you know forms that can take yeah for sure anything else mm, I was thinking about it the other night but like now all of a sudden it's just gone out my mind yeah well you were la you were here last year too so it's yeah. not super fresh um, but uh it's exciting this time of year though. It is. because everything's hatching. And well, from last year to this year, the amount of babies that you've got is a big yeah. difference. Because yeah. when I was out here last year, you had just started the hatching season. Last year was a very different season mm -hmm. than this one. It's been much more more steady as far as yeah. hatching and more exciting. Yeah. So. so uh, awesome. Well, let's get to some of the actual YouTube questions. We appreciate you. Get some really good ones based on what I saw coming in and uh, work compiled them into some of the... Uh, some of the best ones. Yeah. 
So first question comes from Ball Python Boulevard. Amazing snakes and great video. What are the top three points or advices do you have for someone just starting to breed? So I wrote an article about this on my blog. So my vlog, my uh, it's JKR uh, Ball Street Journal .com. Check that out. Um, I did. I think I did a top ten. But I think the main things were was was two, which which was um, buy good equipment. You know, just yeah. don't skimp on what's going to keep your snakes safe, keep your collection safe, because Agreed. in the end. All the best planning can be undone by a small piece of equipment, you know, yeah. and they can't can't allow that. Right? Yeah, not agreed. The other one is to buy your collection purposefully. You know, don't just buy based on what you see on the market, what you see available. If Justin puts a new snake on Instagram and looks awesome, sure, I'd love for you to buy it, but that may not be the best strategic choice for mm -hmm. you. Um, so have a plan and what you want to do. Most people figured this out themselves because the initial I talked to I talk to my customers all the time and almost every one of them invariably will say, Well when I got started on this business I ended up buying a bunch of snakes that I didn't that don't fit my plans yeah. at all. Because just that initial excitement. I mean you, you could talk to that a little bit. Yeah. I've seen that happen. Well I mean you and I had this discussion last year as well. Um, like I can go back I can take it from the market side back home. It's a case of people are buying what the market wants at the time rather than buying for your collection to create a market. Mm, that's because really, really good. if I recall, you had a chance to get into the Coral Glow Banana Project early. Sure. But you went a completely different direction though. Sure. At the time. And that has proved better for you than having done the Coral Glow Banana Project. Yeah, it, that project treated a lot of people really, really well, but it was kind of a feeding frenzy there. Mm. And my gut reaction has always been to avoid that and, and go and spend my my capital where people where I feel like there's hidden gems yeah. versus the one the thing that everybody knows about everybody's chasing um, and that's that's a cool idea there's so many hidden gems out there yeah. um, the market and you know one thing to memorize or to realize is that um, initially the market rewarded people who um, was all, it was all about the new morphs. You, know, you get a new morph, you mass produce it. I say mass produce it. You produce it yeah. until the price goes down. And But there was such an endless supply of new morphs that it was pretty much just a matter of produce it. But when the price gets to a certain point, you jump to the next big thing. And then you produce it. And that worked really, really well for maybe the first 10, 12 years of our market. Okay? I mean, that, that was still happening about, what, three, three four years ago. Yeah, it was tapering off. Maybe should, I don't think it should have been happening three or four years ago, but it still was, and it still is. To but extent, I mean, but yeah, when the bamboo and the bongo stuff had just started coming out, those were a couple of more more recent ones yeah. for sure. Um, but that mentality meant that when the vault, when the, when the, the project, the morph got to a certain price point, all the big the main breeders, the well-known breeders would give up on it yeah. because it suddenly wasn't commercially viable really in the same sense. And they would make that next investment and start pushing that next project, which means that there is not just a couple, there is dozens of mutations that w were out early and then suddenly people were told that they shouldn't care about them anymore. Yeah. And there's so much to do with them, so much incredible things. Um, and I've, I tend to look at this in business not as in, in that investment, that new morph, but what's invested in the creativity and what can be done. And just because something is inexpensive does not mean that you can't make the craziest, most insane ball python that you could possibly imagine with it. Um, that. Yeah, rethink everything. Um, yeah. So anyhow, but a lot of people make the mistake of buying um, these males, you know, just getting a few morphs initially because they're so excited about it. But then they'll, you know, they'll, it's a mistake that a lot of people have to kind of experience themselves and then they'll reset and fix it. Um, well, I'm kind of going through that method at the moment, that reset yeah. method back home now. Yeah, it's a continual thing too. Mm -hmm. Even if you've done it fairly right, you're always going to be reevaluating, yeah. you know, if you're doing it, if you're, if you're doing it well. Okay. So next one comes from HBP. Awesome video, Justin. Uh, man, those highway pads are awesome. Same for the Magma project. 
So here's a question. Do you have any combos coming out that are more intense than the Magma project? Boy, I hope so. Um, so the Magma is is hot, but I love it and I'm always, I mean, the, the next cool thing that's better than a Magma might be Magma plus something, or it might be something completely different. Um, I can't, I can't predict in advance how cool something will be. I'm always just trying to experiment with what I think will be kind of explosive, what I think will be kind of just, you know. Like reactive thing. Right, react, exactly. Um, but boy, I can't predict it. But I believe in my heart that there's stuff way cooler out there than I, anybody I, has ever thought of. I feel like there's going to be some absolute mind explosions coming out. You think that so? you probably, well, okay, when I say it like this, um, the way you might think it's overlooked, mm -hmm. but then for someone like myself going, I actually like that far sure. more than the Magma Project. Sure. So it's also well, that's the thing. Everybody's things. got their opinion too. You know, on on top of it, of what looks cool and what, you know, some people love those dark black snakes, mm -hmm. and some people like you know the bright yellows, and people like the more reds that we're going towards and oranges. Um, there's something for everyone, but I really believe the best is still to come. Thank you. You know, and hopefully, hopefully we'll find it sooner. Let's keep <laughs> let's keep digging. Okay. Lance Kirkman, this one's actually directed at me. Warwick, what's the Afri um, African gene America's got to get? That is a bit of a tough one because there's a whole lot of new stuff in South Africa, but it's still a case of the concept of it's in certain readers' hands and you can only get into the project if you're willing to drop the big bucks. Sure. So, I mean. That's true for a lot of new projects, yeah. But I mean, I was lucky to get into one project fairly cheaply. Um, but yeah, it's just a case of you have to work those projects. Well, I think a lot of people don't realize is that although South Africa is in Africa, we're just further away from where they're about as far from from where ball pythons are from as we are here in America, just about. Or maybe it is more or less. I'll probably say Florida's actually closer. Really? Well, because yeah. I mean, yeah. we're in a completely different hemisphere. Yeah, they don't have any special pipeline no. of ball pythons that we don't have, but. They do have a very, very dedicated group of breeders over there who are really, you know, really love their ball pythons. Yeah. So there's been some neat stuff. Um, and hopefully we'll see some of that kind of make its way stateside mm -hmm. over time. I'm sure they will. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this one's a bit of a long question. Let me put that oh. down. I need two hands to read this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that just sounds so bad. Okay, this comes from Boba Basement. Great job as always. Question, five fly clowns. What variances have you seen with this combination? I made a number of them this season. Most are in your face fireflies, and we are wondering about the in-betweeners. We know there are at least pastel clowns, but there's definitive characteristic that we can identify to determine 100% if they are fireflies or just pastel clowns, with no more than a strong influence from the fire gene. Any help would be greatly appreciated. Keep up the great work. Okay. So I guess that's true of any mutation. There's always going to be those in-betweeners, you know. Mm -hmm. um, on firefly clowns, you're looking for typically, you know, a wider head, less pattern on the head. You're looking for an overall kind of a creamy yellow versus the more stark yellow of the pastel clown. Um, but the biggest... The biggest way I guess we'll know requires keeping the snakes for a while because mm -hmm. the fires are going to be brighter, more light yellow over time, and then the pastel clowns will darken, the fireflies will, will light lighter, the pastel clowns will darken. That requires a lot of time and effort. Um, in the end, sometimes it's about going with your gut, you know, and, and being questioning yourself to an extent, but also realizing like, hey, um, I really. It's just going with your gut. If you have an eye for ball pythons, um, you have a certain amount of self-doubt, but you also have a certain amount of, okay, I, I think I, I know what I'm seeing here. Um, at the same time, if you can't decide, then and, and, and you do decide to sell, then you definitely should sell it as what you know it is, and you may right. let the customer know what you think it might also be, but save yourself. You know, It's always better to give something for free than it is to have somebody feel like they were taken advantage of or they didn't get what they paid for. That's, that's how we do it. Agreed. Okay. Um, 
empty universe. Uh, great video, love the combos and that you're uh, sharing them. Speaking of African imports, what are the main components you look for when importing a new morph? What's the deciding factor to adding it to your collection? Thanks, guys. Okay, um, so I don't do a lot of dinger projects compared to some. I mean, everybody's got their own like thing they work with. Um, in the past, I've done a lot more. So when I'm looking looking at an African captive hatched baby, um, there's just a lot going on in my brain when, I, when I'm evaluating that. And it comes from just all the years now that I've seen them year after year be offered to me or offered to you know, the public. And the initial thing I look for is, is, is there any sign of stress to the baby itself, okay? So initially I'm looking for, is it an odd size baby? Is it, is it small? Did it come from a, a small egg that, like a boob egg or something? or did it not absorb its yolk? Um, some sign that, that it had egg stress, because egg stress can cause pattern, all kinds of pattern changes. So I'm looking for anything that might show that it's not, had, didn't have a completely normal incubation. So small baby, uh, you know, there's a small kind of compressed head, um, weird body shape at all. Um, the other thing is you're looking for any kind of kinking at all, even tail tips or whatever like that. Um, and then another one that a lot of people don't know about is that a kind of a, a really faint form of a birth defect will be that the body will have a seam down the entire belly or most of the belly, okay. kind of like what you're used to seeing from the umbilical cord where the umbilical goes in, um, that little like slit there, which you'll see that is running down a lot of the body. And one of the last things that the ball python does in development is the belly closes over the, all the internal organs and everything. And sometimes if that closure is somehow stressed because of the, you know, the environment that it's in, that closure will leave a seam um, there over the organs. And um, you'll just see where it came together and the scales don't line up quite right or something like that. That's just a, a low form of, of a birth defect, but it shows you that, that that crazy paint job on top of the baby may not be a, just a standard genetic reproducible thing. So um, it was just a pattern variation within the incubation due to the strain. Right, and if you know if you, if you've hatched a lot of ball pythons over the years and, and done had the experience, you know that sometimes you'll have clutches that, for some reason, you will get that odd looking baby in a smaller egg or something. Well, yeah, but you'll, you'll tend to find that yeah, yeah, usually it's the smallest egg will have the craziest looking baby for whatever reason. Yeah. Um, but also you'll see that just in general, if you have a a clutch that gets a little too cold or a little too hot or whatever, it'll have, sometimes it come out with crazy patterns, but it's because of the incubation, not because of anything genetic. Um, so I look for that first. Second of all, if the animal's perfect looking, there's no issues with it, then I immediately say, okay, how is this different or similar to what I've seen in the past? Because I've been able to see a lot of people who have tried to produce things, to try to reproduce things, tried with dinkers, and I've tried with a lot of dinkers, I have an idea of what kind of things don't typically prove, or is it something that's already already proven in the market? Like, is it another form of granite or whatever? And, you know, we have about a million different types of granites, and maybe yeah. that's not something to spend big bucks on as a captive hatched. Um, then again, the GHI was also a granite yeah, type and a very awesome one. So there's just all these different things. In the end, the animal has to really jump at me to be worthwhile. Okay. Um, and I like to get girls. If I ever get a dinkers, I almost always like to get girls because then you don't actually have to expend as much breeding capital on them. You just put a nice male to them. If they don't prove out, you got whatever nice genetics that the male had and yeah. versus if you get a male captive hatch dinker and you end up expending a lot of girls on it that and it doesn't prove that the pain is much greater in that situation. I agree. So. Okay. Next question from Josh Knox. Ask Justin question. What's in that Don Pompey? Laugh out loud. Uh, you know, it's <laughs> funny because no one's actually ever asked me that. Mm. So it's a um, it's a red stripe clown. Is it okay? Yeah. Did the battery die? Yeah. 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 Okay. So Plug that off. But I hope it got that. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay. Next wow. Next question. All right. Well, hopefully that's answered their question. Yeah. Okay. 
Next one from Carlo7823. Question for your Q&A. First, first, awesome video and updates as always. So the question, it's amazing how many morphs have evolved in this hobby since the beginning. I'm still just amazed with how it started and with just a few morphs. It's gone from a few morphs to hundreds out there and still folks like you are creating insane morphs. Mm. Do you think eventually it will slow down or it will continue with more and more different morphs as the more combos as yeah, as more combos come out and then bring to others? Is it just an endless cycle? It's not like it's talking about new morphs mostly, like the mutations, not just combos? I think it's a combination of both. Okay. Um, but under the concept of combinations, I would just say it's not... The word endless cycle isn't quite a word I would use. Yeah. But I think there is a lot of possibility still to come. For sure. I mean, I if you look at it from a mathematical point of view, it is essentially endless. Right, because every mutation could be combined yeah. endlessly. And the amount of time it would take talking about hundreds of thousands, you know, I don't know, thousands of years, I don't want to over hyperbolize, but, but there's no meaningful end to it. However, of course, there is a point at which, you know, it becomes pointless if, if all those things are slowly turning white, yeah. right, by adding too many genes. So I don't know the answer to that as far as truly endless. However, I can say for sure that there is so many, 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 many more years to come. And I think that we'll also see, the amazing thing is, is that say we got 10 years down the road and at some point we started to feel even slightly constricted as far as what ought to be done. Um, then we could just at that point, if there's any new morph, like if any morph pops up, it takes and takes everything that exists and get it to the power of two. Yeah. Right? Like it just... Well, you and I were having this conversation the other day. It's a case of um, we got lucky in the sense of in the Blue Up Your Sister combos, the Black Arts, and the right. Ivory combos that we were given a way out from producing the All White Snakes. Sure. So that is where the concept of endless cycles comes from. Right. Because if we were only stuck with the other babies with the White Snakes and the White Snakes. Yeah. So yeah, we were talking about that. How the there's you know ivories, blue eyed lucies, black eyed lucies, mm -hmm. all of which are white snakes that, although you could keep combining in them, it seems fairly pointless because there's just more. There's snakes. only so much you can do, right? Visually speaking, um, but that but that nature has kind of give us a cosmic out on all this because we have the the key to those projects, which makes it a non-white. Yeah. So. If you go with the Black Eyed Lucy, you have the vanilla and the disco, right? Yeah. Which combined with the fire won't make a white snake anymore. Um, and they have non-white supers. Um, with the yellow belly, we have asphalt. Gravel. Gravel. Spectre. Spark. Spectre. Spark. You're right. I'm trying There's, to think of anything else in that complex. There's a couple yeah. others that are less known in that complex as well. Um, but that, again keeps you from making the white snake. Of course, of course, leopard was almost a little bit of that too because just leopard would take and put all that pattern back on the eye. Yeah. Um, it's just interesting, you know, in the blue of those we have the crystal stuff um, and then the daddy, the daddy gene, yeah. right? Um, so it's got, it's kind of cool. It just went, I, I, it's, there's always an out, it seems like, and that nature has just provided with so many different cool combinations and cool different angles and everything that it becomes more about not what's possible, but more about how you structure your collection to take advantage of the different um, angles and twists and turns of the of the hobby as it yeah. goes, to keep your flexibility and also you know not get back into some kind of mutation corner, mm -hmm. right? I suppose the way as you're talking about it's how you structure your collection. On that, you're only limited by the possibility of what you can think of, right? So I think that's also a key factor in this whole concept of an endless cycle. Yeah, but I, th I think I think that you have to watch out that you don't ever go in so deep on any particular project that you lose your ability to pivot um, and to 
go a new direction or to change and, and recreate the project. In a different concept and different lots. Correct, correct. And it's interesting how different problems present themselves over time because when we first got into this, everybody wanted to make a white snake. That was everything. And then a few, just a few years down the road, a new problem existed that nobody could have foreseen, which was, oh no, if I'm not careful, every snake, every clutch I make will have white snakes yeah. because I have fire and everything, and I have lesser and everything, or whatever. But it's not just that, it's a case of you've also got to be aware of which combinations of the codons and recessives also tend to lead towards a white snake. You have to, yeah, you have to be aware of it. Mm. Knowledge is everything. But then uh, with that knowledge you have to take and Make sure that you're not just blindly breeding, that you're thinking about where the consequences of what you're doing will lead yeah. five, ten years down the road. Yeah. Interesting question. Good question. Okay. <clears throat> um, from Hog78 Hunter, I seen a scuba mask and my question would be, why does Chase get a vacation? Uh, no, just kidding. For real though. <laughs> What's <not> real? <laughs> For real though, what's the easiest way, sorry Chase, I think I've just ruined your vacation time here, man. Um, for real, what's the easiest way to prove out an unknown gravel slash yellow belly? Someone told me an ivory would be a great way to go, but I know some people on the internet, in inverted commas, know it all, but really know nothing. Thanks. Uh, they say advice is worth exactly what you paid for it, mm -hmm. right? So. Uh, so this advice is worth exactly nothing. No. Um, so I would say if you're breeding out a gravel or a yellow belly, you can breed it to a yellow belly. Um, that should give you results, really. If you make it, if you make an ivory, you know it's a yellow belly. Your your male is a yellow belly. If you if you make a highway, you know it was a gravel. But the problem is you might not always hit on that. Right. The problem is that your odds for a super, you know, acts like super type, and that is one in four. And although that seems fairly easy, it's pretty easy to miss on even a one of four in a clutch. So an ivory is a better option because you're taking your one of four down to one and two. What sometimes happens is I'll try to prove out something like that, a gravel or a yellow belly. And what will end up happening is I won't get, because my odds are a little long, I won't get anything in the clutch that will tell me one way or the other. That happened in one of my the, highway clutches, yeah, right? Yeah, the pestle pod uh, highway clutch. Right. Um, so the female was gravel or yellow belly. I still don't know because I didn't hit an ivory um, or, a super, or a super gravel in the clutch. So I so I've, I didn't really waste a year. I got an awesome clutch, but I wasted a year in the sense of knowing what she is. And um, using super form like an ivory or something like that can really fix fix, fix those odds and make it a lot more likely to find out without taking a whole other year to do it. Okay. Um, sorry, just battling you on my phone. Uh, Jordan Strupp, sick video. It's two questions, but I can ask them simultaneously. You've mentioned it before, a good example of a specific gene. We all know a good looking pastel from a dirty one. Can you give some pointers on what to look for in a high quality red strap? And the question too is, are you going to have any available in the next couple of years? So I can start saving. So I'm assuming he's asking for good quality okay. red straps. Sure. So in general, when I look for best examples of a specific gene. You look, you want something to be the best at what that gene is trying to be, right? So if you're looking for the best pastel, you want the best, best brightest yellow, the blackest blacks, best blushing, whatever. Um, if you want the best orange dream, you want the brightest orange that you could possibly get, the best contrast. Um, if you're looking for the best red stripe, you want the best stripe you could possibly find, the best um, kind of rusty red color you can get. Um, on the really, really good ones, they're very striped, they're very rusty, and then they have the pattern that's kind of pulled apart, and these, uh, what we call flames coming to the side, are, are just extra rusty red you know, in a way. That's kind of where the name came from. Since then, we've seen you know poor examples on the market as well, um, as well as good ones. And starting with a good example is really, really important. And usually it doesn't cost that much more. No. I mean, maybe a slight premium, but for the most part, it's more about finding it. Um, I'll definitely have some available at some point um, either this year and in the upcoming years. Um, most of mine are really awesome quality. Mm. Amazing, yeah. 
also, as you were saying, like just try to focus in on that base one because I mean I've got two red stripes at home. Right. And uh, I was very unsure of the one until you came and agreed with me yeah. that it was a red stripe. Right. For sure, it's. They can be tough. They, it's true for any morph. Red stripes though are relatively subtle. If they're not amazing, mm. they are easy to overlook. easy to overlook. Yeah. Okay. Okay, last question from Renee Rasmussen. Sorry, Renee, if I'm... Thanks, Renee. Um, hey, Justin, this is Renee from Denmark. I have a question for Ask Justin. At what size do you think males are best for breeding? I know you can breed as low as 300 grams, but what size do you prefer? That's a good question because I've heard a lot... I've heard people recently just talking about that, and I don't understand where some people are coming from on that. Um, I've heard people say, oh, they keep, keep your males small, keep them all under a thousand grams, don't feed them that much. Um, you know, you can breed males at, you know, three, four hundred grams. And I'll just be, I, I can't speak to that because I've never done that. So I don't, I can't say that that doesn't work, but I can speak to my experience, which has been a lot. And that is that I don't keep my males small. I don't make any effort to regulate their size at all you know I feed them well to to get them up to breeding size um, and then as much as they want to eat in the future they can get to be 2,000 I have 2,000 gram males and they breed great I don't I haven't found any laziness or yeah. any downside I would feel bad keeping them small just to keep them small because I feel, I feel like their appetite is something that nature gave them and I should respect that um, as far as breeding young males, I've just not found it to be very effective. Um, I can breed a male at you know six, seven months old, but I've found that if they're not very large, if they're really small, they usually don't sire any clutches. And even if they seem to be locking up, I just don't find that they're very, <laughs> I'm getting much babies out of, the, out of snakes like that. So you'll you know? probably end up with a higher slug ratio. You either get what you either either get is as I've had this many times where you'll get a male that seems to be breeding but he's on the real small side and then you'll just get slugs because there was he wasn't giving viable sperm even though he may he either was locking up or he may have just had his tail under there and wasn't actually locking up because he's so young. Um, but the other thing we get is there's a lot of times when you're trying to get these young males in you had a different male in earlier in the season just to get the girl started and you think okay. I'm going to bring this young male in at the last and hopefully he'll steal away the clutch or whatever. And if that male that you're bringing in is, you know, very small, I don't, I don't ever see it working. Yeah. You know, it just, it, it's almost always the older male who sires the clutch. He's got much more viable sperm. Um, so I just, you know, personally, I, I have some success breeding young males, but usually they're in the six, seven hundred range, um, gram range. And usually, when I start breeding them, those first few locks don't ever really mean anything. They don't actually ever produce any babies. It's, it's when you get a male going in that little bit bigger size and you keep them going strong for a few months, usually you start to get some really good yeah. results as that goes. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's a bunch of experimentation, but I just don't think that keeping males small makes a difference and I don't think breeding extremely small has any real advantage. I just don't think you get anything out of it. Okay. Yeah. So is that it? That's the, that was the last question. Awesome. Well, thanks guys for submitting some great questions and I hope you enjoyed the answers. Hope we can do this more. This is it for uh, Snakes and Starbucks. <laughs> with the Star Wars mugs. Yes. You got, uh, you got some form of chase with you today. Mine looks like Death Star kind of at San Francisco. Um, <laughs> But uh, thanks for joining us, and thank you. hopefully we'll do it again soon, Warwick. Thanks, Justin. All right.